Good afternoon. I'm Tom Robinson, and th this is a session on um, the obesity epidemic with a focus on novel solutions. The, uh, I sort of wanted to start by, by sort of making note that, that whether you're aware of it or not, uh, the obesity epidemic really is already affecting everyone in this room and everywhere else. Um, and a lot of uh, the purpose of, of focusing this session on solutions is hopefully to get you to think about what you might be able to do to play a role in addressing the obesity epidemic. Um, for uh, my part in this session is first to give you a little bit of background um, about the obesity epidemic, and particularly childhood obesity epidemic, and, and then give you a very brief sort of overview of the type of research that uh, we do in my lab to address it. And then we have three really um, outstanding panelists who um, are going to um, bring a different lens to this problem and, uh, and introduce you to other types of solutions that may get you thinking about your role in, this, in addressing this problem. So why do we call it, to start out with, why do we call it an epidemic? I think the word epidemic is probably overused. Um, but, but in this case, I think it's really... Uh, quite appropriate. Um, we've never really seen a chronic disease change so rapidly and so broadly as we have with obesity in the United States and really globally. And as a result, um, we're seeing very rapid changes in its impact on, on health and society more broadly. So we, def we define obesity in children um, based on their body mass index, which is a measure of their weight um, divided by the square of their height. Um, and so that adjusts for, for body size or body height. Um, and then in children, because the BMI, or the body mass index, normally increases with growth as kids get older, um, we also have to adjust it for um, age and sex. Uh, what you see here is, um, is the... Uh, rate of obesity in U.S. children in the 1960s um, and 70s. And that was the time before we started to see this uptick in terms of the obesity epidemic. And so the CDC decided that was the period of time that was become, going to become the reference for defining what obesity was or obesity is in children. And so at that point, it's the 95th percentile of the BMI in the population for your age and sex um, during, the, uh, during the 1960s and 1970s. So that's the reference point. And so as you could ex would expect, during the 1960s and 70s, during these assessments, um, about 5% of children are above the 95th percentile. So then what happened? Well, the next time we did a national health and examination, or health and uh, nutrition examination survey was about a decade later, and it had already doubled in school-aged children and, um, and teenagers. A decade later, it had tripled from that original rate. And then it continued to go up, and here it is by the, um, by the end of the first decade in the 2000s. And then at that point, they started doing the examinations continuously and reporting it every two years, and you can see that it continues to go up, or at least stay the same. It's not getting any better, except for that one glitch you see in the preschool children. Um, but now with the most recent data points in 2015 and 2016 being high again, the thought is that, that both the, the earlier data and the, the low data were actually outliers and, and misleading. Um, in that although we're seeing in some communities some, reduce, some reductions in obesity, or at least plateauing of obesity in young children, that um, as a, a, around the country, it seems to be at least staying the same and might be continuing to increase. Um, the other thing that is important to note is that it's not distributed equally across the entire population. And in fact, in the United States, one of the big risk factors is socioeconomic status and race. Um, race and ethnicity. And here you can see, with the blue bar being um, Hispanics, um, boys on the left, girls on the right, um, and the, the gray bar being non-Hispanic blacks, that those are the two groups at greatest risk, particularly Hispanic boys and um, 
and Hispanic girls and non-Hispanic black girls, um, where the rate is either about 25% or more. So think of this, is that at one point, remember, the, the standard was the 95th percentile, so 5%, we're seeing five times the rate that you would expect or the rate that we would expect was normal growth um, in, in these groups. So quite a bit different. Um, the other thing is this isn't isolated to just the United States, is that while we're leading the rest of the world, and in this graph you can see the black line at the top is the United States, and this is a combination of overweight and obesity, so that's why the prevalences are a little higher. Um, but as you can see, with a variety of countries, um, ranging from countries like Mexico to Iran to, to China, you see all of them show a similar trajectory of increase. Most of them started behind us, or all of them started behind us, but many of them are starting to catch up, and with some of them, the slope of changes over time has been even greater than it has been in the United States. Um, this is where I get to convince you that no matter what your specialty or what your interest in, in child health or adult health, for that matter, that obesity is going to become relevant to you, even if it isn't already. And that's because obesity affects um, essentially every um, organ system in the body. And um, I'm going to run through these quickly because uh, we don't have time to go through all of them because the list is so extensive, but just to give you an idea. So um, the obvious to most people is cardiovascular diseases with lipid abnormalities and hypertension um, and uh, associated with early coronary artery disease and stroke, of course, is one that people are pretty aware of. Same with some of the endocrine problems as well. So type 2 diabetes, the current CDC projections are that one in three of today's children will have diabetes in their lifetime. Think about that, one in three of Americans with diabetes. And if you happen to be an African-American or Latina female, the risk is one in two in your lifetime of having diabetes. Um, gastrointestinal problems, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is an interesting one. Um, and very, we're seeing much more of that now in, in, uh, in children, uh, overweight and obese children. And um, it's, it's particularly damaging because as you get the effects of fatty infiltration and inflammation in the liver associated with it, it progresses in some children to a cirrhosis that's indistinguishable from alcoholic cirrhosis. And the projections are now that, that really within the near future that non-alcoholic steatohepatitis is going to overtake alcohol as the number one reason for getting liver transplants. Um, central nervous system problems, uh, more asthma, obstructive sleep apnea, of course, is well known. Um, orthopedic problems, more osteoarthritis, um, slip capital femoral epiphysis in children. Uh, GU problems with renal insufficiency and renal failure at higher risk, as well as erectile dysfunction. Um, more skin rashes, um, psychiatric problems, in particular, an increased risk of disordered eating behaviors and depressive symptoms. Um, pregnancy and complications of pregnancy in terms of more gestational diabetes, more hypertension during pregnancy, a greater risk of C-sections. Um, and it turns out that it's also um, a major risk factor for prematurity and low birth weight, um, as well as birth defects. Um, more uh, overweight and obese people are more likely to be injured in motor vehicle crashes and more likely to die from motor vehicle injuries. Um, Anybody here interested in cancer? I know this is uh, an area of interest um, to many people. Well, uh, the projections are now that by the middle of this century, um, obesity will overtake tobacco as the number one cause of cancer globally. Um, more surgical complications, it's more difficult to operate and give anesthesia to obese patients. Um, all of this leading to more premature death, shorter lifespans, and you've probably heard it said that this may be the first generation that lives a shorter lifespan than it's the prior generation, um, mainly because of the obesity epidemic. And one that's often over, or, or ones that are often overlooked, but are extremely important, especially in the lives of children and families, is stigmatization, prejudice, and discrimination, which are highly rampant in society, even um, among obese patients themselves, or obese persons themselves, tend to discriminate and stigmatize other people based upon their weight in our culture. 
In addition, it's not just individual costs related or individual um, problems associated with obesity, but there are major societal costs as well. The current estimates are that more than $150 billion per year are, are, is the cost of direct medical care in the U.S. for obesity, um, not including indirect medical costs, and not including all the costs in society that we're bearing. So absenteeism from work and school, reduced productivity, more disability are more common as your BMI goes up, um, as well as the cost that it's going to be to re-engineer the school, work, community, and home environments. Everything from having to, to put larger uh, chairs and desks in schools, to build larger MRI scanners, to, to put more fuel in airplanes, because the major driver of fuel and one of the major costs in airlines, for example, is weight. So at its core, obesity is a pretty simple problem. It's an imbalance of energy, where you consume and store more energy than you burn. Um, however, um, actually, it, it becomes a little more complex than that, and, and the causes for it tend to be fairly complex. But in fact, in many ways, as I look back at my interest in obesity, that go back to when I was a, a medical student, um, that, that what got me interested was how, how complex this problem was from a societal point of view. And in fact, if you look back at what drives this energy imbalance, you see that, that really, in some ways, the obesity epidemic, the global obesity epidemic, is really almost inevitable, in that we've created a world um, on purpose in which um, calories are very tasty, they're highly prevalent, they're, they're almost everywhere you look, um, they are promoted heavily, um, and they're cheap. And at the same time, we've engineered opportunities for physical activity basically out of our lives and out of our, um, out of our lives in terms of everything from, from the use of automobiles to texting instead of walking down the hall to say something to someone. We've really eliminated opportunities for even light activity. So this is how this complex system is portrayed in one way, and this is from the uh, foresight group of the UK government that tried to map all of the causes um, around obesity in, in, um, in society as a whole. And you're not meant to have to read these, obviously, but, um, but the, the crazy thing is, too, that each of those nodes you see has a similar figure behind it that drives it. So it's, it's considered really a classic complex systems problem, and one that is going to not be addressed by any single solution, but one that's going to require lots of solutions at different part of the system that are going to perturb the system and hopefully move the whole system in a, in a different direction. So that's where we get to solutions. And those of you who know me um, know that I have this thing about solutions. In fact, I call our lab the, the Stanford Solutions Science Lab because all of our research is really framed and designed to come up with solutions to practical problems. Um, and it, with obesity, in fact, we feel that there's a lot of hypotheses about, about um, solutions without having been um, in a lot of theories about it, but really less work into really um, testing those solutions, creating them and testing them. And that's what really the rest of this panel is about. Um, I just want to run through quickly some of the types of things we're doing that focuses on changing behavior, um, either at the environmental or the, or the social or the individual level, to try and um, change that imbalance in calories. So, um, a lot of our work has been focused, or some of our work in the past has been focused on, on screen time in children. We've shown in randomized controlled trials that if you develop interventions to reduce screen time, you actually reduce weight gain in children substantially, more so than any of our interventions that directly targeted activity and diet, in fact. Um, another thing, thinking about things we can do in the home and changing the home environment. We've gotten involved with plate design, even, and the design of dishware. And here, this is from a study in which we showed that if you just add a rim to a plate, depending on the size of the rim and the markings, you can actually... Um, people actually see the food on that plate as being about as much as 10% more than they do on a plate without a rim and changes their perception of what they're eating. And in fact, we've now done studies where we take smaller bowls, plates, 
and glasses, including plates with rims, and actually give them, replace the dishware in people's homes um, as part of more multi-factor interventions. Um, we've done a lot with after-school team sports. Um, and this is from uh, a project called Sport, in which we developed an after-school team sports program specifically for overweight and obese children um, to get them involved in this in a non-threatening way in, in movement. And when we randomized children to be eligible for an after-school sports program like this, um, that they actually reduce their weight gain, substantially reduce their weight gain compared to children who are taught, who are given health education and taught about their health. Similarly, a number of, of projects in which we do uh, ethnic dance for girls. Uh, this picture is of Ballet Folklorico for Mexican-American girls. We've also done studies of African hip-hop and step dance for African-American girls. And in one of these studies, we saw a reduction in... Um, a substantial reduction in cholesterol levels, as well as cutting the pre-diabetes rate by two-thirds over a two-year period of time for a dance and screen time reduction intervention compared to health education. And some of our recent work also even focuses on climate change and whether we can do climate education in children and environmental education and teaching in this project Girl Scouts and other projects, high school students, about the ways of reducing their energy use and their climate footprint, their greenhouse gas footprint, by altering their diet and changing their transportation choices. Um, and in fact, again, in randomized controlled trials, we show that interventions like this can actually change children's diet and activity uh, behaviors compared to, um, to good rigorous controls. So that's sort of a really brief exposure to some of the work we're doing in our solution science lab. And now um, I'd really like to hand it over to our other three speakers to, um, to talk about other real novel solutions. But before I do that, um, I wanted to ask you a favor. I'd like to change things up a little bit. We've had a long day, and I'd like to, to ask you um, uh, for, to, to start a sort of a new tradition now, and that I'd like you at the end of each of our speakers to give them a standing ovation. <laughs> okay? And there's a couple purposes of that. One of that is it makes them feel really good, right? So if you give them a standing ovation. The second is it makes you feel really good to get a, give a standing ovation. And the third is what I call a stealth intervention. It gets you up on your feet and out of your chair and moving at a time in the day when you're probably more likely to want to nap and stay still. And some of you probably know that there's some evidence now that sitting may be the new tobacco. So... But, okay, <laughs> I didn't mean me, <laughs> but. Thank you, that feels really good. <laughs> Does it feel good to you too? Did it? Okay, so our, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Julie Parsonet, and Julie is the George DeForest Barnett professor of medicine and a professor of health research and policy. She's extremely well known um, for her work as an uh, infectious disease epidemiologist, particularly work with uh, Heliobacter pylori, which has changed the world, uh, her research in terms of, of, of that, and uh, stomach ulcers and the, and the way we treat um, uh, we, the way we treat those symptoms, as well as work in diarrheal diseases, TB, um, and prolonged fevers. And um, she um, is going to give us a very different view of the obesity epidemic from the perspective of an infectious disease epidemiologist and the role of the microbiome and infection in obesity. Thanks so much, Thanks. Tom. Thank you so much, Tom, and um, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you. Um, as Tom mentioned, I am an infectious disease specialist, and I began my work with Helicobacter pylori, or much of my work with Helicobacter, which is an infection that... Uh, it affects the stomach, and once you have it, you have it for your entire life. It was a very, very common infection at uh, the beginning of the uh, 20th century where almost everybody in the world carried it, and it's disappeared over time. And what's interesting about it is as it's disappeared, weight has gone up. Now, I could say the same thing about, you know, as we've gotten televisions, weight has gone up, and a lot of things have happened, but they actually have done randomized trials, and they've shown that people in whom they treat H. pylori gain weight. And so it raised in my mind this uh, possibility about what are these infections in our body doing and, and what do they do in terms of increase, it, it, uh, 
increasing metabolism, increasing the number of calories we consume in a day in, using our basal metabolic rate, and what they may do for weight in the long term. So um, I'm going to start here with a picture of, this is a, a simulation of a person as they would have, a man in his uh, middle age, as he would have looked in 1960. And you can see that he's uh, just a normal sized person. And this is the same uh, average person in 2010. And what you can see is that he's a little taller. Um, he also is bigger. He's got bigger thighs, bigger calves, bigger chest, bigger abdomen, not as good a haircut, um, which I'm not sure what that means. But, um, but, and we all think about this and say, oh, this guy's been, that we've been eating more and all these other things. But I do also want to point out that the guy who, in 1960, was born uh, in the Depression. Okay, so he was born in a time when a huge proportion of the population had diabetes, uh, had um, tuberculosis, a huge proportion would have had all those vaccine preventable diseases that we don't have anymore. He would have had measles and chicken pox, and he would have had uh, rubella, and he would have had recurrent diarrheal disease, and all these things that may have impacted how he grew as a child. Um, whereas this person who in 2010 would have been born in the 1980s and wouldn't have had any of those. His life would have been much cleaner and much better in terms of his infectious diseases in childhood. So looking at it now for what we see in children, this is a child uh, from the developing world, from um, a resource-limited country, who's growing up in an environment that's, that is uh, quite dirty and where there's uh, not very good food resources. But this is a child particularly who's got chronic diarrhea, something that we rarely see in the United States, but which is a big problem uh, in, in resource-limited countries and was actually a very big problem 100 years ago in the United States when we started, before we started looking at this obesity epidemic. So we don't see that, but we also don't see most of these things anymore. So um, when we look at children in the United States, these are diseases that have largely disappeared in children and in adults in the United States, and some of them are very important. We don't see rotavirus anymore. We have a vaccine for it. We, I said we don't see Helicobacter very much, an organism that I work with. No more tuberculosis, no more cholera, no more recurrent diarrhea. We don't see children with very often with post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis. All of these things are gone. So the environment that these children grow up in has changed a lot, and the calories consumed by these diseases have disappeared. And this is what I mean by calories. This is a paper that was done a long time ago, uh, 1986, where they looked at the calories consumed by one day of measles. And I want to point you down to the, one, the line that says energy shortfall in one day of measles is that they lose 18, uh, 1,840 joules, and you can divide that by three to get calories. And then down to a further line where it says extra requirement to regain the lost weight is 4,000 uh, kilojoules, uh, which is actually the equivalent here of 1,204 kilocalories a day that this child would have to consume to regain that weight. And this is one day of measles, okay? So when you're talking about children who in the past have had recurrent infections throughout their life, they would have to eat an awful lot to get back to that weight that we're seeing children today who don't get those infectious diseases. So the other side of this, is, aside from these acute infectious diseases, is that there's a lot of indication that the organisms that line your gut may be associated with the development of obesity. And I'm not going to go through the, the details of the microbiome projects. There are many people here who can discuss that better than I can. But I will tell you that if you take mice and you take, who are uh, obese mice, and you take out their microbiota and put them into a thin mouse, that mouse will get fat. And if you take the microbiota out of a thin mouse and put it into a fat mouse, that mouse will get thin. So there are some really great data that these microbiota do play a role. And those, too, are probably changing in humans over time as we have increased exposures to antimicrobials, and in, uh, and, uh, including and specifically antibiotics. So we've been trying to look at this. And I'm now going to just talk about uh, a little bit about a study that we've been doing. And then I'm going to come back to evolution over time uh, for the last few slides. So we have a study that we've been doing, a very, very labor-intensive study, and I need to thank several people in my lab who've done a fantastic job, uh, especially Luz Sanchez. It's called Stanford Outcomes Researching Kids. And in this study, um, we're looking at all these things and how they influence, ultimately, the weight of children. So we uh, uh, um, are looking at the microbiota, so the, the bacteria that live in the gut and the skin and the mouth, um, 
And we're also looking at their infectious disease symptoms. We're looking at their immune response to see if their immune response is upregulated when they get infections. And then we're looking at their virome, so the total amount of viruses that they have in their system. And then we're looking at all these other things that surround them, their mother's uh, microbiome, what they eat, their in what happened in utero, their de delivery methods, the household structure, all sorts of things that we're trying to look as we follow these children from in utero to age three. And this is basically how we do it. We recruit a pregnant mother. We then go visit them at their house. Um, and we at this point, we supplied them with some antimicrobial soaps. Half of them we gave antimicrobial soaps, and the other half we didn't. I'm not going to talk about that today, but um, they, we have some interesting results with those soaps as well. Um, we then call them on the phone every week, and we ask about the baby's health for every single day. Did this baby have a fever? Did they have an upper respiratory infection? Did they have diarrhea? And if they didn't, we ask about sleep and activity. We go back to the house every four months, and we recollect all this information about the household, who lives there, what the house looks like. Is it clean? Is it dirty? We swab the counters. We have all sorts of uh, pieces of their sponges and all sorts of things. Um, and then, when, after the baby's born, we do the same, all these, uh, collect all these data on the baby, and we measure them and see how much they've grown over that period of time. And we have 160 moms and 136 babies in this study, and we've followed most of them now for three years. Not, not all of them, but most of them. So this is just one slide I want to present uh, about the, the results. I have three results slides to show you. Um, and this one, on the x-axis, you'll see days of fever uh, in these babies. And on the y-axis, you see the amount of gain, weight that they've gained over their first three years. So these are days of fever in the first three years and weight gain in the first three years. And what you'll see is there's a modest association negatively. So the more days of fever, the less weight you've gained in those first three years. And I want to point out that these are really healthy kids. We, we selected these to be all healthy kids and all normal healthy pregnancies. When we then adjusted this and looked at people that we, to divide the group into two, so uh, people who had less than a 12th grade education and moms who had greater than a 12th grade education, we actually saw something quite different. Um, the mothers who had less than a 12th grade education often just told us the baby had fever, but they actually never took the temperature. But the mothers who had greater than 12th grade education were much more likely to provide us with a real temperature that was taken with a thermometer. So we know that those are more accurate. And what you'll see is that um, the babies who had more fever were in that uh, higher educated group really had a, a fairly close relationship between the days of fever and the amount of weight they gained in the first three years. And this was uh, the, the amount of fever they had could explain 20% of their weight gain. That's a huge amount uh, to be explained by this one factor. Some of the other things we did is looked at their immune system. And I'm not going to go into this in, in great detail for those of you who are not immunologists, but I want you to look at the boxes on the bottom. This is work that was done in Scott Boyd's lab um, by Sandra Nielsen. And we looked at the development of various antibodies over the first three years of life. So if you look at the bottom ones, the IgG um, 1 through 3 especially, those are the antibodies that are most responsive to infectious diseases. And the bars on the right are what an adult level is, and the dots are each of our children, with the green dots being at age three. And first of all, I want to point out that the, the amount of antibodies these kids are getting are not climbing a lot. They're sort of slowly creeping up. It's not a big increase over the span of three years. And by the end of three years, they're nowhere near adult values uh, of the amount of IgG that they would normally have. So they're... they're it doesn't look like they're getting overwhelmingly infected. Let's just put it that way. They're not, the IgG is a response to infectious disease, and we're not seeing in their immunoglobulins that they're having a big response to infectious diseases. Um, this is not the amount of immunoglobulin, by the way. This is the number of mutations they have, which suggests the number of different organisms they've seen over the span of their lifetime. Um, and similarly, this is looking at their, their uh, B and T cells, which are other markers of the immune system. And this is done by something called CYTOF. And again, this is a very complicated uh, area, which I'm really not expert in. So I will just point out a few things to you. The top five, four are children in Bangladesh. And the bottom are from our cohort, the STORC cohort, Stanford Outcomes Research and Kids cohort. And the blue are naive B cells and T cells. Um, on the, the blue, let's put it on the, le on the left hand side, are naive B and T cells. And you can see in the Bangladeshi children that those cells are depleted over time. So at week 18, there are a lot of them. And at week 104, there aren't very many. 
which suggests that these children are seeing a lot of infectious diseases and their immune system is being very highly activated. Um, on the bottom, if you look at the, the children from our cohort, they don't change at all. all right? This is a span over three years, and they've barely, their immune systems have barely budged. And actually, if you look at week 156 in our children and week 18 in Bangladesh, they look almost exactly the same. So our children have these very, very naive immune systems, and they're not having their systems revved up by the infections that you see in other, in, in, uh, other parts of the world. So we've been hypothesizing that, that these infections really do play a metabolic toll. And one of the best markers of metabolism is actually temperature. So we decided, well, let's think about temperature. What's, what's the story about temperature in humans over time? So when you want to learn something new, you read an old book. This is um, uh, Carl Wunderlich, who was the first person to really write about temperature in uh, the middle of the 19th century. He was a professor at the University of Leipzig. This is his book, which I will not insult you by saying in German. Um, and he did one million axillary temperatures on 25,000 people. And you can imagine without computers, like writing down all these million numbers on 25,000 people. And he came up with what we know today to be the normal temperature, 37 degrees, 98.6 Fahrenheit. He pointed out a lot of things that we know to be true, that the temperature is lower in the morning than it is in the afternoon, that it varies with menstrual cycle, and that temperatures are, more, are usually a little bit higher in women than in men, and that the elderly have a lower temperature than younger adults. All those things we know to be true. But then this guy comes along. His name is Phil Makoviak, who's an infectious disease doctor in Maryland. And he's written a book on fever. And he says, wait, wait, you know, he's wrong. That temperature is wrong. 37 degrees. It's not 37 degrees. So he went and did a study. And, and, and all of you, I bet you half of you go to your doctor and you say, he says, oh, you don't have a temperature. Your temperature is 98.6. You don't have a temperature. And, and you go and you say, well, but my temperature is normal 97.5. It's not 98.6. And that's actually true. If people go to the doctor now, their temperatures will look lower. And so he did a study where he had 148 healthy young adults, and he measured them at four different times uh, uh, for three consecutive days, and found that actually the red line is the normal temperature, 98.6, and their temperatures were consistently lower than 98.6. Um, and so his conclusion, just the first sentence here, is that 37 degrees, 98.6, should be abandoned as a concept related to thermometry. But his conclusion was that Wunderlich's thermometers were wrong, okay? That this wasn't just an issue about temperatures changing, that Wunderlich had calibrated his thermometers wrong. And he actually grabbed a thermometer of Wunderlich's that he had, was in the Mutter Museum in Philadelphia, and he checked it, and it read high. So we decided to look at it and see whether it was really dropping over time. And again, this is one of the best markers of metabolism. We were very lucky through the, uh, the uh, Population Health Sciences Group to identify the Union Army Pension Database, which includes temperatures from 166,000 veterans of the, of the Civil War, uh, who were born between 1800 and 1850. And they had 670,000 temperatures in that group because they would come back over and over again. And uh, the temperatures were obtained between 1870 and 1940. We then compared them to NHANES, which Tom mentioned before, which is our national survey. Um, there's one NHANES survey where they did temperatures, and they did them on 15,000 people who were born between 1896 and 1953, and the temperatures were obtained in the 1970s. And then we compared them to Stanford clinical data for outpatients uh, at Stanford who, who uh, were coming in, and we have 578,000 temperatures that were taken in 2007 to 2017. There are differences in how these temperatures were taken, by the way, of different thermometers, but um, we've tried to figure out how to adjust for those things. Um, and um, what we found is seen here. These are the temperatures. There's age at the bottom and uh, uh, on the x-axis, and then the temperature is on the y. And the green line is the temperature in the Union Army cohort. And then the blue is in the NHANES cohort, and the red is in the uh, current cohort. And you can see that the temperatures on the mean temperature has indeed dropped over time. When we adjust for, for age and weight and height, which are all associated with, uh, with uh, temperature, the, the drop is 1.1 degree Fahrenheit uh, over that period of time, or 0.6 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, centigrade, which is a lot. We were worried that this is because the thermometers were different. So we said, OK, well, let's look within these cohorts and see what happens. And this is the, the Union Army cohort. So these are all these Civil War veterans. And the lines are their years of birth. 
So if you were born in the 1820s, your temperature is higher than if you were born in the 1830s, and your temperature then is higher than if you were born in the 1840s. So even within that one cohort where they're presumably using the same thermometers, the temperature is declining over time. So this is our model of it. And again, you can see that this is a, a, a decline. This is men. It's true in black men and white men and black women and white women. The women are in red here, and uh, there are no women in the Union Army. Um, so we have no women's data from then. But you can see that uh, in, in all groups that we looked at, there's been a decline in temperature over time, even since uh, the, eight, the 1950s. So I do think that infections are important. I think that our microbiome is important, and I think that we have evolved over time to be different people than we were before, and some of that is being related, and we're seeing that in metabolism, and I think that some of the changes in weight we're seeing is a reflection of our change in who we are and how we are living in a microbial world. So here we are, this is the, the David of, of uh, Michelangelo, and maybe this is the David of the future. <laughs> um, I think this is a very complicated field, though, because we don't want to bring back infectious diseases and give everybody measles, and we don't want to make sure have everybody have Helicobacter. But I think we do have to try to come to grips with what really is normal in the modern world. What are our normal exposures? What's our normal metabolic rate? And then we can start to work um, uh, forward from there. So thank you very much. Okay, next up is Anisha Patel, and Anisha is, is one of the newest members of our Department of Pediatrics faculty, um, although she, she's not totally new to Stanford. She was a chief resident, a resident and chief resident here in the uh, Department of Pediatrics and at Packard Children's Hospital. Then she left for a little while to do some training and start her faculty career at UCLA and, and UCSF, and then we've attracted her back here and she's an um, associate professor in our Division of General Pediatrics. Anisha. Thank you. All right, so thanks so much for the standing ovations. And I'm looking around for water because I'm going to be speaking with you about the role of drinking water access in promoting healthy weight. So I'm going to start off with a story of how we even started working on water access. A lot of people ask us that question. So when I finished my pediatric residency here at Stanford, as Tom mentioned, I went down to UCLA to complete a fellowship in research. And when I got down there, there was a um, mentor of mine, Mark Schuster. He had received some funding from the National Institutes of Health to partner with community-based organizations there to develop an obesity prevention program. And when I arrived, it was in the fall of 2006, and we were in the schools observing what the students were eating and drinking and also their physical activity levels in the school. And on one of the days when we were observing, students came up to us and said, we would really like to have water to be available with our lunch. And this was the lunch tray in LAUSD at the time and probably still today and also in many schools across the country. They had, you know, the wrap burrito and carrots and at least an orange, but the beverages that were available to the students included flavored milk, which most of the students were actually selecting. They also had a choice of plain milk that didn't have any sweeteners and juice. And if the students wanted to get water, we then followed them around and saw that they could access this drinking fountain. How many of you have seen this drinking fountain in your students' schools across the, the, in the California schools? So they could go to this drinking fountain. It was October, so the water that came out was actually lukewarm. It wasn't super cold. Um, they also had no cups, so they could just get a couple quick sips. And most of the students, honestly, weren't drinking from there. The other option, these were low-income students um, in very underserved neighborhoods. They could go to a vending machine and also pay for bottled water, um, but the bottled water was sitting right next to a sports drink. So if you were a high school student or a middle school student, you would probably choose the sports drink if you were paying for that, but a lot of the students actually didn't have the dollar to pay for that beverage. So at that point, being new to research, I went to PubMed and look to see what was the evidence related to drinking water access as an obesity prevention um, strategy. And what we found at that time, there really wasn't a lot on drinking water access or its role in obesity prevention, but there was emerging data suggesting that consumption of sugar-sweetened beverages or beverages such as sodas or sports drinks with added sugar was associated with obesity and actually comorbid conditions such as the ones that Tom has mentioned in his presentation. 
What we did find, however, was looking at national health and nutrition examination survey data, which you guys both have mentioned as well, was that if these adolescents were to substitute their consumption of sugar-sweetened beverages with water, they could actually lower their consumption of added sugars by 10 teaspoons per day. They could also decrease their caloric intake by 235 calories per day. And to put that in perspective, the American Heart Association actually recommends that children and adults only consume up to six teaspoons of sugar per day. Add, those are added sugars. So because this was a community-based participatory research project where we were partnering with community-based organizations to develop this obesity prevention program, we periodically had community advisory board meetings where we would present data from our research and also get feedback from other community partners working with us on what strategies to implement as a part of these programs. And during one of these meetings, I was presenting about this lack of drinking water access in schools and how the students really would like to incorporate that into the program. And there happened to be an uh, advocacy organization in the audience, um, California Food Policy Advocates. And so they heard this story and actually went to policymakers in San Francisco and introduced legislation that requires water to be available in school cafeterias. That then led the way to um, federal legislation as a part of the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act. And both of those policies have been in place now since 2010. However, we know based on our work that policy implementation is definitely variable. So what we do a lot of times is we will conduct surveys. I'll give you some of that information as well, where we call up schools and ask them about water access on the school campus. The principals or other administrators may say, yes, of course we have drinking water in the cafeteria. But then when you go out and visit, you'll see a scenario like this where there's like a mop and a broom next to the fountain obstructing use. Sometimes there's trash in the drinking fountain. So this clearly isn't the most appealing place for students to obtain drinking water. However, there are schools that have made great gains. Um, they're really listening to this law and promoting it in terms of the spirit of law, wanting to really get students excited about drinking water and know about the health and also cognitive um, functioning benefits that could confer from drinking water. So they install these reusable water bottle filling stations that are new um, and more, have more functionality than a traditional drinking fountain. They put out cups and they also provide promotional signage. So why is this important? I did mention that back to many years ago when we were in Los Angeles Unified, we saw that not many students were actually drinking from drinking fountains, but we wanted to systematically understand that more. So we went out to 24 schools here in the San Francisco Bay Area and actually observed how many students were drinking water in school cafeterias. And this slide, you can see results from that study. Um, the percentages of students who are drinking water from these fountains at lunch range from 11% in elementary schools to low as 1% in high schools. So it was quite low. Then our next steps were to understand what can we do to actually promote water intake among students. And so we decided to conduct a randomized control trial in 12 San Francisco middle schools where we installed two different types of delivery systems. One was a bottleless water cooler like you see on the left. The ne next one was a water dispenser that the cafeteria staff would fill up with chilled water on a daily basis. And both those sets of schools actually had cups as well then the control group received no intervention, so they just had their traditional drinking fountains. And what we saw here, you can see the bars depict the change in the percentage of students who are drinking water over time. So in the schools that had the bottleless coolers, 10% more students were drinking water, and in the dispenser schools, 18% more students were drinking water, whereas in the control group, there was no change. Since that time, there have been a number of studies, both domestically and abroad, that have suggested that providing appealing water access to students in schools can help prevent obesity. In Germany, for example, there was a study where they installed a bottleless water cooler and provided students with reusable water bottles. And in that study, they found impacts on obesity. Similarly, in New York City public schools, they installed these dispensers in the cafeterias and provided cups, and they saw similar results. Currently, we're in the midst of a randomized control trial in San Francisco Bay Area schools where we are implementing similar programs. However, we're taking it to the next step. Um, we're not just installing the water stations in the cafeteria, but we're expanding access to other parts of the school cafeteria as well as physical activity spaces and other high traffic areas of the school. 
We're also giving students reusable water bottles to use at, during the school day, and they also receive one for home. And then there's a curriculum that we've developed that's very interactive to engage the students and get them excited about drinking water. We're examining the impact of this um, intervention on not only what the students are eating and drinking, but also their obesity status over time. So I have alluded that there are some key characteristics that signify effective drinking water access. So by that we mean, what does it take to get students to drink water in the schools? What would be truly effective water access? And this is um, criteria that we've developed with partners nationally who've been working in this area as well. One is making sure that water is available in key locations throughout the school, so the areas where the students are more likely to be during the school day. The second is making sure that there's sufficient number of drinking fountain access points so students aren't waiting in line and so that they're not missing class to try to find the water in the school. The third is having non-fountain water sources, so I've already shown you why traditional drinking fountains may not be sufficient, so looking to install water bottle filling stations, for example, or providing dispensers. Drinking vessels are also key. Studies have shown that if students are provided with drinking vessels, not surprisingly, they will drink more water. And um, the last two points are kind of common sense, but making sure that the water in the school is actually safe and has been tested, particularly for lead um, here, because that's still a concern in many areas. Making sure that the water source is appealing to the students, is kept clean, and also is functioning. So this last slide is data that is not published. Um, it's a study that we are conducting and finishing now, but we've basically 10 years ago, um, five years ago when the legislation passed um, in 2010, um, 2011, we conducted surveys with a random sample of California school administrators, asking them questions about drinking water access on school campuses and specifically about these areas of effective water access that I mentioned. We've also repeated the surveys five years later to see if there have been any changes um, related to the policy over time. And in this slide, you can see the red signifies the 2010-2011 survey data, and the um, turquoise color also signifies the most recent surveys. And the asterisk signifies the areas for which we've seen significant changes over time. So you can see that in terms of schools providing um, water in key locations throughout the school, providing adequate water access points in terms of numbers, non-fountain water sources and drinking vessels, those have all significantly improved over time. With regard to safe and appealing water and clean and functioning water sources, those have pretty much stayed the same. So I'd like to leave you with this pictorial, which is in a toolkit. If any of you are interested, I can provide it to you, but it's for parents actually specifically if they're interested in trying to improve water access in their student schools. But it just shows you the different elements of providing effective water access that I've mentioned, including making sure it's available in the cafeteria, other key locations, promoting water through signage or other means, having non-traditional reusable water bottle filling stations um, in schools, testing the water, publicizing the information. One thing I didn't mention was actually role modeling, so making sure that other staff at the school are also drinking water and not drinking sugary beverages in front of students making sure drinking vessels are available, allowing students to actually get up and get water. We've seen many cases where students are not allowed to actually get up during lunch to access drinking fountains. And lastly, building a culture of reusable water bottles. Um, we don't see in a lot of the schools that we are currently working in that a lot of the students actually bring reusable water bottles from home, so that's also an important consideration in terms of reducing waste and not using cups. So I'd like to thank you all for um, listening. gave you some extra minutes. <laughs> Great. Um, our third speaker, our final speaker, I guess, fourth now, if you include me, but mm -hmm. our final speaker is Doug Judy. And, and uh, I just realized when, we, when I was thinking about introductions that, that we have two speakers who were former residents and chief residents here. So Doug was also a pediatric resident and chief resident at um, Stanford and Packer Children's. Um, then he left to cross the bay to UC Berkeley, where he's an associate professor um, in the School of Public Health, and he's also the executive director of a national organization called Health um, Build Healthy Places. Pl Build Healthy Places Network, <laughs> um, and he's going to talk to us about 
applying um, a perspective from community development to improve children's health. Great. All right, there we go. So <clears throat> thank you all. Thanks to you, Tom, for uh, having me. It's, uh, I haven't been back down to Stanford for a little while. Um, so one question I get a lot is sort of how is a pediatrician working with the community development sector, and specifically actually with the Federal Reserve System? And like a lot of people's research, it's often these things happen by accident. And, and in my case, the accident was that while I was doing my postdoc in population health up at UCSF in Berkeley, the guy I was dating at the time, my now husband, was a graduate student in history at UC Berkeley, and he was studying uh, uh, finance and history of affordable housing and community development. And we would have conversations about this. And I, as I gradually came to understand the scale and scope of the affordable housing sector and the community development sector, I said, wait a second, you're addressing the things we worry about as social determinants of health, but you're not thinking about the health implications of that work. And he said, well, maybe, but you guys just study poverty and its bad effects and don't do anything about it. <laughs> and I said, yeah, that's actually kind of true. And so now my work, the network is, we're, as, as Tom said, we're a national organization. We're a program of the Build Healthy Play, or the uh, Public Health Institute based in Oakland. And we now work to bridge these sectors and identify shared goals in order to uh, bring these resources together. So I'm going to start with two problems that I see that we are facing. The first is what we spend on medical care. $3.3 trillion a year. <clears throat> that is a mind-boggling number. And in fact, think about what 1% of $3.3 trillion is. $33 billion a year. 1%. Now, that is still a big number to wrap your head around. Turns out Head Start in the United States costs about $8 billion a year. We turn away half of the children who are eligible for Head Start because we don't have the money for it. We're talking about one quarter of 1% of what we spend annually. Another way to think about it is we, <clears throat> remember the dam that almost failed a, few, a couple years ago, the Oroville Dam? They talked about all the dams that need to be repaired across the country. It was too expensive. We can't possibly do it. $20 billion, less than 1% of what we spend. The real problem, though, is less that we spend it. It's that most of that is being spent on chronic disease. And this is really the connection to uh, obesity, which is what's driving a lot of that. Over 80% we spend on chronic disease. Most chronic disease is preventable. And most preventable chronic disease is happening in low-income neighborhoods among low-income people. It gets back to the poverty question. So the second thing we face is that doctors know this, but we don't know what to do about it. This was a study done by RWJ looking at, this was interviewing uh, pediatricians and primary care physicians about how are social needs, unmet social needs, affecting their medical practice? And what you can see here is that the vast majority recognize the importance of unmet social needs on the health of their patients. You can also see in the next slide, 75 to 85% recognize that these unmet social needs are beyond their control and affecting their ability to provide good care. So what I'm here to talk about, really, is the community development sector, in my opinion, can help us address some of those problems. They are our partner in this. <clears throat> and why is that? That's because we talk about social determinants of health. We often think about socioeconomic status, income, education. But a lot of the factors you see here on the screen are place-based. They're in neighborhoods of the sorts of things that community development addresses. So what's some of the evidence that neighborhoods are connected to health? This is a relatively new field. A lot of the evidence is actually more correlational rather than causal. Uh, these are some of the factors, housing, affordability, stability, quality. A colleague of mine, Megan Sandel, in uh, uh, Boston at the Boston Medical Center just published a study last month looking at 22,000 families and found that 33% of them had regular rent, uh, had, were behind on their rent, and that those kids of those families were 40% more likely to be uh, poor uh, or, or um, of, of in poor health, 20% more likely to be hospitalized also had negative effects on the parents. So these things play out. Transportation, we know that the ability to walk to transportation or not plays out in obesity and other uh, health factors. Food deserts and food swamps. Interesting study, a woman named Tamara Dubowitz, who's at RAND, uh, they are now doing a randomized controlled trial of a grocery store in a, desert, a food desert in uh, Pittsburgh. And they've been following families now for three years to see what changes they have. So this is actually getting more rather than correlational. What's interesting, though, is what they're finding is complicated. Like, well, we saw that, that uh, diagram that Tom put up of all the arrows. 
complex systems don't respond the way you think they will necessarily. They did find reductions in sugar intake. They did not find any change in diet overall, strangely enough. They did not find any change in obesity. And interestingly, the improved sugar intake was not among the people who shopped at the new grocery store. So there's a sense of change that happens in neighborhoods, but not necessarily among the people you think. Um, the moving to opportunity study I want to mention, interestingly, I don't know if Raj Chetty is here already. <clears throat> this is the study you've seen in the newspaper a lot, uh, partly through his work. This was a randomized control trial of moving families out of neighborhoods with vouchers into high-income neighborhoods or other low-income neighborhoods. Again, a, a, a more of a, a study on, on the, um, the impacts of neighborhood poverty mixed effects. Similarly, focus was not on health, focus was not on children. There were some obesity effects, improvements in adults, uh, and some mixed effects on kids in terms of um, uh, risk-taking behavior. Uh, but that's sort of where we're at now, so there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And uh, I mentioned toxic stress because the growing understanding is that that's sort of the mediator of a lot of this, is, is it gets into your body and changes the way you function. So you've heard this uh, zip code is more important than your genetic code. That's a sort of a standard term that we now talk about. The reason I am interested in this is because in many ways the community development sector is in the zip code improvement business. This neighborhood right here is the poorest neighborhood in Houston. Now imagine having that as your downtown in a low-income neighborhood. This is a 90% immigrant neighborhood, the Gulfton neighborhood of Houston. And this is an example of what community development can look like now. Small businesses right next, bo next door <clears throat> is a grocery store. Affordable housing, housing and urban development, HUD, has not built housing in any major scale for 40 years. It's now this sort of uh, network of community development actors that I'll talk about in a second. So what is it? What it's not, and this is important, it's not urban renewal. This picture probably looks familiar. These are the old projects. This is pruitt Igo in St. Louis. Now what's important to remember is when this was put in, this was considered um, the top of the line thinking at the time. If you look closely, you can see a bus. There's transportation, playing fields, brand new school, church, brand new high rises in place of really run down um, uh, tenements. But 15 years later, there's a historian, and since I live with a historian, he tells me this a lot. The end of modernism happened on the day that pruitt Igo was demolished because it had failed the towers and the park concept. So over time, there has been a growing effort to bring the community in to uh, make these types of decisions. So I want to talk about how this works, and then I'll show you a couple examples, uh, innovative examples. So the scale of this is one of the things that has, had struck me, was that the community development sector invests between 150 and $200 billion year, dollars a year into low-income neighborhoods right now. And I said, how, I've never heard of this. How is that possible that these are, this is happening in the neighborhoods where I work? happens with a network of organizations, CDCs. So on my website, buildhealthyplaces.org, we have a jargon buster because I've been at meetings where the entire meeting, folks thought CDC was in Atlanta and other folks in the room were thinking Community Development Corporation. And when they finally light, when light bulb went off, they're like, oh, I got it. CDFI is a community development financial institution. There's about 1,000 CDFIs. These are nonprofit banks that help weave these dollars down into a package that neighborhood groups can actually manage. There's affordable housing developers. I'm on the board of Mercy Housing, board of trustees. They're, a national, they're the largest national nonprofit uh, affordable housing developer. So where does the money come from? Part of it comes from uh, state uh, or um, federal resources. So the biggest one is the low-income housing tax credit. This is a means of getting tax credits to corporations, but the dollars are then spent on affordable housing. So it's interesting because it's politically palatable because the left gets high quality housing for low income people and the right gets uh, tax breaks for corporations. New Markets tax credit is for job creation in low income neighborhoods. Um, healthy food financing initiative is how a lot of grocery stores are built in food deserts. But the big driver is what's called the Community Reinvestment Act, CRA. This is the regulation that requires banks, for-profit banks, to invest money into neighborhoods, low-income neighborhoods, where they take deposits. And why is that? You guys may recognize a map like this. You guys have heard of redlining? So it's become much more prominently known. Well, it turns out we've been trying to address it since the 70s. It was really only implemented in the 90s fully. 
But these are uh, maps, the federal home loan banks, uh, uh, maps of Philadelphia, and they had them all across the, uh, the country, of neighborhoods that were safe to invest in and not safe to invest in. They eventually became effectively codified. Not surprisingly, this is Philadelphia. The red neighborhoods were the African-American neighborhoods, and those tend to persist over time. So the CRA drives investments into those neighborhoods. So I want to give a couple examples of where healthcare in particular is partnering with community development with health in mind, which is really, these, most of these are quite new. So this is an example. This is uh, Stamford, Connecticut. What happened there was the Stamford Hospital was building a new, wanted to build a new high-rise tower. They didn't have the land to do it. And directly next door was a large public housing project. What they did was a land swap. So the uh, hospital got the property where the big public housing project was on, and they had other property they owned nearby in small six, parcel, six small parcels. They swapped that, and what you see at the bottom is public housing. That's what public housing looks like nowadays. <clears throat> That's the townhomes with the low-income families. They didn't lose a single unit of affordable housing. The, the hospital got its tower, and with their community benefit dollars, they helped invest in the uh, urban farm uh, that families can use. Another interesting example, this is actually Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. They wanted to build a new pediatric clinic. The city had property. They had a recreation center that was run down, an old library that was run down. So they jointly pulled together. The city provided the property, and they built this really beautiful community health and literacy center. Library, recreation center, for new free clinic for adults, and a pediatric clinic. And Children's Hospital actually had the New Markets tax credits. It's the first and only time I know of that a hospital actually had received those tax credits initially. So this one is a, th this one we're sort of expanding out. So this is called the Conway Center. It was organized by a group called So Others Might Eat. It's a faith-based organization that helps people gain jobs and uh, has a, f a food kitchen and whatnot. <clears throat> the Healthy Futures Fund is a $200 million loan fund that is aimed at two things simultaneously, affordable housing alongside low income or uh, clinical care for low income people. So what they do is they use that to incentivize putting those two things adjacent to one another. It's the Kresge Foundation, um, an organization called LISC, one of those nonprofit banks, and Morgan Stanley, interestingly. <clears throat> so this was about $40 million of money came from the Healthy Futures Fund out of a $90 million project. And what I like about this example is it has 200 units of affordable housing, half of it for families and half of it for uh, single homeless adults or who tend to be very hard to house. There's a job training center. There's a brand new clinic that uh, sees 15,000 patients a year. Retail, you can see the green space, and it's across the street from a transit stop from one of the metro stations. So you can see with some incentives, you start to actually address multiple social determinants at one time. So I'm about to end here. So I want to, so the, uh, uh, where we're headed, I think, is more large scale um, efforts that address multiple social determinants of health at once. So interestingly, one of the best <coughs> examples in the country is happening right now in San Francisco called Hope SF. It builds on the Hope six federal projects that were tearing down the project, the old public housing and replacing them with uh, mixed income housing. What they're doing there, there are four sites. This is Potrero Hill, the Potrero Terrace and Potrero Annex. And what they're gonna do, you see it there at the bottom of the screen in downtown San Francisco in the back. They'll replace it with this. You can see the street grids have been reconnected. Those are townhomes with central protected courtyards for children to place, have safe play. They're going to have retail. This is what the housing looks like now. This is Sunnydale. This is right now in San Francisco. People that we live near live in conditions like this. Uh, Mercy Housing is actually redeveloping the Sunnydale project. These are the plans. They've broken ground. These will be the new townhomes. You see lots of new green space and parks. And this will be the community hub at the corner that will actually face out to the, to the neighborhood. It'll, you can see there's a market there. There's going to be a preschool and a YMCA. So again, we're kind of, you can, almost without even thinking about it, this is why I like when I talk to medical audience, you're like, well, obviously people are going to be healthier here. So our vision is healthy, equitable communities for everyone. And the reason I do this work and why I think it's important to talk to researchers is that Right now, this connection between the two is not fully acknowledged. We don't measure health very well in a way that's useful for our colleagues in community development, and we definitely are not yet paying for it. So our work really is to accelerate the flow of healthcare dollars, try to move some part of that trillion dollars spending on preventable chronic disease 
using some of these approaches that we know that work and move towards uh, healthy, equitable communities. Uh, and I'm going to just end, this is a quote, so Risa Leviso More is the recent past president of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and two years ago she spoke at the Community Reinvestment Act banking conference, so picture head of a largest health and foundation in the country speaking to a banking conference, saying we're likely to look back at this time and wonder why community development and health were ever separate sectors. So I'm happy to talk later, or at the reception later, but uh, we hope to... Um, get health and community development more tightly tied. So come visit us at the network and be uh, fun to follow up. Thanks. I, we don't need this. <laughs> I do like it. <clears throat> okay, we can uh, take questions now if, if people have some. I have... Um, Okay, let me, I was going to start with one for um, Anisha that I thought might be um, very practical, is that there might be some people in the audience who are interested in increasing drinking water in their, in their children's mm. schools or their community schools. And I wanted to know, up to the, your experience to date, have you found that it's easier to go in and try and change everything? Because there were a lot of things on your list. And try and change everything or to sort of get your foot in the door first, and if you're going to do that, what would you start with? I mean, I could tell you an example from my child's school <laughs> hmm. where I tried to intervene. Um, she's an elementary school currently and is a fifth grader, and when she started there, back when she was a first grader, um, I met with the principal and some of the school staff, and we talked about installing water stations, but they felt like it was too challenging to get the district to approve the water stations, and just now, finally, um, one of the class gifts was to actually provide the school with drinking water stations. Um, and so I do feel like many schools now are turning towards these water bottle filling stations when they have to put in a brand new fountain. It's a much better option than putting in a traditional drinking fountain. It actually does not cost much more. So we've seen significant changes just with that change. Um, the only barrier I would say there is funding. So a lot of schools, um, there is currently money at the state level for schools that are disadvantaged areas, rural areas, or that have drinking water quality concerns where if they've tested for lead and found contaminants, mm -hmm. they can actually apply for this funding to help install water bottle filling stations and also provide money for remediation if they find contaminants in drinking water. So that is a resource as well. Okay, I see there's a, a question about breastfeeding and childhood weight. Um, I can address that unless somebody else wants to. That's for you, Tom. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> well, it, it's, it's always touchy to, to talk about breastfeeding and childhood weight because there's a lot of really good reasons, of, as, as people in this audience know, to promote breastfeeding and prolong breastfeeding in children. Um, the, the data on breastfeeding and weight, though, has not been as, as strong as it initially appeared. There were a number of early epidemiological studies um, that showed associations between um, prolonged breastfeeding and, and reduced weight. But um, subsequent to that, there were some, um, some either uh, natural experiments or actually true randomized controlled trials in which um, they increased breastfeeding rates in certain areas versus others through baby-friendly hospitals. Um, one of the most famous ones was in Belarus and uh, that have shown no impact of that on, on subsequent um, child BMI, following those kids now up to um, as long as I think they're up to age nine or so. I'm not sure. But the, um, it doesn't mean you shouldn't encourage it, and it's something to, uh, to promote, but in terms of its role in um, obesity, it doesn't seem to be as strong as people initially thought. And a lot of the people who made those initial claims have gone back and are saying mm. it's not that important anymore for that, for that only. Um, I don't want anybody complaining that I was dissing breastfeeding. <laughs> um, let's see, explain, I guess this one more for, for Julie. Um, explain more sort of what the mechanisms uh, you think are in, in how a decline in disease has played a role in increasing obesity and whether you're willing to make that um, connection at this point. I think um, there is, what our data suggests is that infection, 
uh, plays a role in decreasing your metabolic rate. Or, or it, having infection increases your metabolic rate, and the absence of infection decreases your metabolic rate. And your metabolic rate, your me resting metabolic rate, is, is the most important consumption of calories you have in a day. So we actually calculated how many calories different that temperature difference was in a day, and it's 135 calories a day difference now than in um, the temperature that you see back in the, in the uh, middle of the 19th century. So that's a lot when you think about it over the span of a year of life. Um, I, I think people, when they think about what they're eating and their caloric consumption and what they eat and their exercise, they think about themselves as a single unit also, that you're talking about your, your human body. But you actually have more organisms in your body than you have human cells, and those things are also eating. And they're also talking to your cells and telling their cells what to do, and they motivate your immune system to do things. And um, there's a lot of, of caloric activity that's going on with the infections that we carry in our body and with interactions that our infections have with our human cells that, that induce our immune system to act up and to, to, to be more metabolically active. So that's actually what I think is going on. And um, if you think about infectious disease, though, the, the big difference was between the middle of the 19th century when everybody had TB and a lot of those uh, veterans had malaria and many of them had other chronic diseases, cellulitis, wounds from their war, uh, war wounds. But we're still seeing a decline in temperature between 1970 and today and there wasn't that much TB in 1970 either. But what we do see actually over that time is a drop in the C-reactive protein which is a marker of inflammation. So even after those infections have been gone, we're seeing a decline in inflammation over time in that same time period. And some of that may be infection, but some of that is the use of non-steroidals, some of it is the use of statins, some of it is the use of other medications, steroids, that have been decreasing um, our, our inflammatory lives. And I think that is also an important factor in why we're seeing this drop in metabolic rate over time. It's interesting, too, that you, you bring that up, too, because C-reactive protein tends to be higher with higher body weight as well, because obesity right. tends to be a pro-inflammatory mm. process. process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is there any, just sort of as a follow-up, too, from the, is, do you, have, have you made any changes in, in uh, what you do in terms of how carefully you uh, wash your vegetables or, or, uh, um, you know? So I, I, uh, I, I don't want to put out here that Infections are, are, infections are necessarily good for people. And I certainly would not want people to take away that vaccines are bad for people because I think vaccines are one of the greatest miracles of, of medicine. And I think we should vaccinate our children and we should prevent these horrible infectious diseases that kill children at a young age. We live a lot longer than we used to and that's, that's because we've been able to conquer these horrible infectious diseases that we have. Um, but I do think that there is a, this gets to the healthy neighborhoods and all the things people are talking about. I think um, we are sanitizing our lives a little bit too much and that um, children spend too much time indoors, we have fewer pets, we have smaller family size, there's less interaction among human beings. I think getting out and being exposed to dirt is probably a good thing. And, um, and engaging with the, the world and the, not just people but the organisms that those people are carrying and the organisms that are in the environment is probably healthy for our immune systems. And so I, I do think that, that we have to be careful about not being hyper-hygienic in our lives. And yes, I do make, I, I have locked my daughter out of the house to keep her outside, yeah. so. <laughs> <laughs> and the, you know, another an interesting thing coming from the, the work on uh, the microbiome too has been the types of diets associated with what are considered the healthiest microbiomes are lots of fresh fruits and vegetables right. and you know, the same thing that we would want to encourage people to eat. So it's another reason um, to sort of encourage the healthy diets that we do is it may be functioning in some way through the microbiome and through all those organisms that co-inhabit our bodies. The mm -hmm. question for Dr. Parsonette. Mm -hmm. um, just wondered if you wanted to comment on the use of low-dose antibiotics in poultry and livestock and whether there's any correlation or influence, do you think, on human obesity over the past uh, few decades? So the role of antibiotics in obesity has been very, very controversial. It's been enormously difficult to, to study. 
And part of the reason is most of the time when we study antibiotics, we study the antibiotics that humans receive. And um, humans receive antibiotics because they're sick, and when they're sick, they lose weight. So they get antibiotics, and they're healthier, and they gain weight. So people say, oh, well, antibiotics are bad. They make you gain weight because... But that's really because you were sick, and so now you've gained weight. So we've done some work looking at antibiotics in people who aren't sick, and we looked at uh, children with um, acne. So they're not sick. And we looked to see about whether children with acne gained weight if they received antibiotics more than children with acne who didn't receive antibiotics, and we found no difference. So that specific antibiotic, we could find nothing about. I am not a fan of antibiotics in animal feed, but there's no data on it in, in, in association with obesity, and I think it would be very hard to work out. But there's a lot of data on its increasing in antimicrobial resistance, which is a terrible thing. And, um, it does promote, it, it, it was initially put in animal feed to promote weight gain in animals, but even that is a little bit controversial, so I'm, I'm having, I, I don't know that it actually does. Um, that was its original intent. Um, so I, I can't comment on that, that it's increasing human weight. Okay, we have a question about balancing, discussing obesity, body size, and weight with preteens and teens who are at increased risk of disordered eating. You want me to take that one? Sure. If okay. So I'm a general pediatrician. Um, I practice um, with Dr. Sanders, who I saw back there um, at the Gardner Packard Clinic. And um, there was actually a couple studies most recently, maybe you can talk about those too, Tom, that came out that have shown that it's really important the way that you actually word um, when you have a patient who's obese. Um, it's actually not the best terminology to use with the patient and to focus more on the BMI came up as a terminology to use, um, which a lot of folks don't understand, but I think um, pointing out the growth curves is particularly effective in showing you know, what the normal ranges are generally, rather than focus on specific numbers. Um, in addition, I think it's also important, I usually encourage healthy behaviors in general, because for everyone, regardless of your body size, um, these behaviors are very important to health, and we know that even if you are at a higher um, you know, body mass index or perhaps you're at a lower body mass index, you could be at increased risk for diabetes or some of these other conditions. So focusing on the healthy behaviors um, can be helpful. But from your many years of working in the weight clinic, I'm sure you have um, perspective as well. Yeah, well, the, the, I think the um, terms like having a heavy BMI or a large BMI or ones that's, that seems to be favored quite a bit um, in the surveys that have been done with patients has been um, you're heavy for your heavy for your age or heavy for your um, heavy for your size I guess that's redundant I heavy for your heavy for your age and um, is one but that um, phrases that that suggest that um, without putting a label on it like obesity um, that tend to be the types of terms that patients um, seem to feel are less stigmatizing for them. I mean, one thing to note is that we've known for a long time that overweight and obese children are at higher risk for developing disordered eating. And um, whether that's um, directly causal or not, we don't know because there are lots of factors that influence potentially both of, both of those things um, in terms of uh, the family dynamics and other things that are going on. Um, but the uh, um, so we are we we definitely are aware of it, and you should be aware of it when working with families um, to help them control a child's weight is to keep an eye out for the um, the use of unhealthy mechanisms to control their weight. So the fasting the kids will do, skipping meals, um, uh, and then some of the the other unhealthy behaviors like the purging behaviors, um, which often aren't associated with weight loss. They're often associated with additional weight gain. Um, and the, uh, so just to be very alert to those as well. And, and the data on eating disorder prevention seems to suggest that one of the few ways that has been demonstrated to reduce um, disordered eating attitudes, and particularly something called weight concerns, is um, our, our teaching kids about healthy ways to control their weight. So actually teaching them, so it may not be teaching kids about controlling your weight in a healthy way, may not trigger those uh, eating disorders, but in fact it may actually prevent them. So it's, uh, I think the worst thing is to, is to avoid it totally. 
you know, and that's a lot of pediatricians or a lot of family physicians and others may be uncomfortable speaking to families about it, but if you ignore it, I, I promise you the children and the families um, are aware of it. And if you ignore it, um, it doesn't necessarily um, help that situation. So you guys want to take this one? Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, yeah, so what's the biggest difficulty? Uh, <clears throat> in terms of building out the communities, really, in the end, it's tackling poverty. And we've been trying to do that for a long time. It's very, very hard. Although I think what we're beginning to realize as a country is that we're doing it in a, in a disorganized way. And health requires everything sort of simultaneously. That could be harder to fund that type of work. But right now, a lot of our resources, you think about you know, the important work around water. The trouble is a child may now have access to water in a school, but if they don't live in a place where they can play outside, or their parents don't have money for healthy food, or there's no access to healthy food, or, you know, there's all these different things simultaneously. I sometimes think about it as, you know, right now we, we approach poverty in many cases like hovering a helicopter over a neighborhood and throwing all the vaccinations out the window hoping for the best. When in fact we know with vaccinations you have to give them the right dose at the right time in the right order. We don't yet approach anti-poverty work or healthy community work in that same way. I was thinking a little bit earlier today just the sheer scale of research important research going into understanding how uh, glioblastomas form, how to create neuron balls. We have spent no money at all trying to understand how neighborhoods function and how those complex systems in relative terms. So a lot of it is really aligning the existing resources, making sure that that $250 billion the community development sector is putting into neighborhoods is aligned with the work the school systems are doing, is aligned with the work that the healthcare system is putting into neighborhoods, so that when you start to actually tackle everything simultaneously, there's at least a little bit of a hope of, of creating a safe, uh, uh, healthy place that uh, kids can grow up. Doug, another sort of question for you. If there, are, if there are people in the audience who want to get involved in mm -hmm. community development, what would be the first step to take? Because um, yeah. most of us are totally unaware. Yeah, I mean, honestly, <laughs> come to my website, first of all, because I really, I've spent the last several years creating resources to make the overlap understandable and see where the, uh, the linkages are. But in many ways, what I often do, one of the resources we have is called a partner finder. And it's just figuring out who's doing this kind of work where you are. I often actually use it with my community development colleagues who they're like, well, you say talk to the public health department, but who are they? Well, we now have the National Association of City and County Health Officers. I don't know if you guys have heard of NACHO, but there's NACHO. There's a person you can call everywhere. Same thing if for on our side, on the medical side, it turns out those CDCs, those community development corporations, there's 4,500 of them across the country. They are actually real people that you can pick up on the phone and they would love to hear about your interests. There's a real, I actually, when I talk to my clinical friends, I think honestly one of the most straightforward ways of being involved is to join a board of an organization like that or go talk to them about what, what is the hospital doing? What is your clinic doing in relation to these types of things? Then you can learn what they're doing. Similarly, I actually really encourage my community development colleagues and banking colleagues to get on the boards of public health departments or of clinics. So these conversations can at least start. It sounds really basic, but a lot of it is figuring out where the money's going in and where there's an opportunity to sort of align uh, each other's work. So it looks like um, maybe this would be the last question. Um, Julie, this was directed at you, I think. Have you looked at body temperatures, uh, changes in low-income countries over time? So thank you for that question. We would love to look at body temperatures in a, in a resource limited country. And we have been looking for a database that includes that, um, but they just don't exist. And we've been looking for at least six or seven months to just see if we can find one looking systematically at every country that has a, a nutrition survey. So if anybody here has an advertisement, anybody knows of a, a resource limited country that has a good database that includes uh, temperatures, we'd love to look at it. Because yes, we would expect it to be higher than we see in the United States. Okay. So how about one last standing ovation <laughs> for a great panel? For the audience, I think. That still feels indulgent. <laughs>